You gotta unmute. Yeah, unmute your. Okay. No wonder they say. Um. Oh, by, by the way, good day. <laughs> no. Hi. Uh, it, it's 10:38 p.m. in uh, Melbourne now, where yeah. James is. Yeah. Wow. It's, uh, I was just reading the news. Um, I might, uh, when I have my little bit, I might give a little bit of local colour about the state of the state of the union <laughs> in Melbourne. <laughs> Please uh, do. We're in a yeah. <coughs> we're in what they call stage three lockdown. Um, and it's always hard to keep abreast of it all, uh, other than the fact that we uh, have to wear masks. We can't go and visit our friends. Uh, we can go out and shop and buy food. We can do a bit of exercise, but uh, yeah, it's pretty full on. And we had about 600 just over, I think the data last night was another 600-ish. Um, where am I? Got so many things opened up now. It's, I've got too many things opened up. Um, but about over another 600 people contracted it. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Um, and the day before, 723 people contracted it. So that's the kind of numbers we're having uh, at the moment here in Melbourne. Um, and we've even got, uh, I, sh I can even show you, we now have, um, if you can see, oh no, you can't, hold on. I might use it later. We even have now in the newspapers, we have uh, uh, suburb by suburb numbers. <laughs> so you can you can punch on your suburb postcode and see the amount of people that are uh, that are getting this thing and so forth and so on. So it's uh, full on here. Um, but that's, uh, I guess it's uh, what's happening in a lot of places. Yeah, yeah at least you have a uh, government that, that is showing some kind of uh, demonstrating some kind of stewardship, you know, I, well, I'm in Florida, yeah. <laughs> I'm in Florida and it's, you know, I mean, the local government is a little bit better, but you know, the state government, we just have a, DeSantis is a, is a, a mock Trump, you know, and so it's, it's a total shit show. Yeah, it's, it's hard to know. We, we have, you know, we thought we'd, we'd put a lid on this thing a few months ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are, there's a lot of legit, a lot of area for really good old fashioned legitimate argument <laughs> about, about a lot of this um, at almost every level. But what happened with us, broadly speaking, and again, I'm speaking broadly here, what happened with us is we had, uh, we have this quarantine system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys might have the same thing where someone, say someone flies in from, I don't know, I don't know, Fiji, you know, <laughs> you know wherever. Um, they have to go into two weeks quarantine, right? And that's at a hotel uh, hotel room. And what happened was that um, a lot of the cases, some of the some of the people just left quarantine, just what? walked out of the hotel. Um, others, oh, there was even more salacious um, salacious bits and pieces going on. Um, and anyway, the, <laughs> the disease spread out of quarantine, right? Now. Well, don't so, you have, aren't, aren't there, doesn't quarantine need to be staffed? I mean, there's no such yeah, thing yeah, as yeah, that. I this is, I'm not, I'm like, um, I'm going to be discussing things I'm not really that expert on. <laughs> um, but essentially, yes, but they had private security guards uh, doing it. And none of them, it, from what I can understand that I, you know, I, I don't want to speak out of, um, out of turn or, or beyond my, my knowledge, but my understanding is, is that, uh, None of them were really trained that well, and um, it just wasn't taken that seriously, at least by some, by some, not by all, of course. Um, but the upshot was, yeah, the upshot was that it, it got out. Um, and so people are pretty upset about that. Um, they're pretty upset about that. And it now seems to have gone in and, and, and embedded itself in the community. Whereas before it was something that was coming in from the outside, yeah? Uh -huh. um, so you get it, you know, what, what they used to say right at the beginning, you know, this is the rich man, the rich person brings it to us and the poor person suffers for it, you know? Yeah. Um, so all the people, all the people, the tourists and the travelers and people, wealthy people, essentially. Um, I mean, I'm being a little bit, a little 
little bit unfair, but um, probably a lot unfair. But uh, anyway, basically what's happened now is it's embedded itself into the community and it's, it's generating itself, if that makes sense. You follow what I mean? Um, versus sure. before. It was um, something that was largely coming from outside. So we had cruise ships and you know problems with cruise ships and people getting uh -huh. off. Um, so this was a this is a very difficult uh, situation for us. And we're in what they call stage three lockdown. And they're already occasionally you hear people mumbling about the possibility of stage four. But What's uh, that? So, well, that's a good damn fine question. <laughs> you know, very good question. Thanks. Yeah, you know, what is stage four? Um, yeah, I, oh, I mean, I can't imagine how how much more. You know, at the end of the day, you have to be able to go out and shop. You can't. You've got to eat. Um, yeah. Do they do? Um, do they have any um, delivery or curbside pickup services or anything? Yeah, like yeah. That? They do all of that, especially with. Um, and I think stage four. I, I don't want to speculate because I, I actually. Until they declare it, I, we don't really know what that would be. Um, right. I certainly don't. Um, we also then have this kind of, um, I guess, law and order issue, uh, if that's a way of putting it. I hate that phrase, but uh, um, for example, I'm, I'm looking at the front front uh, website of Nine News, which is one of our, you know, news channels here. Fifty three fined in Melbourne for refusing to wear a mask. It's a two hundred dollar fine, by the way. Hi, hi, Prof. Uh, Lucas Bull, are you there? Sorry, James and Scott interrupting. Oh no, we're just I'm just battling off. <laughs> Can you unmute your uh, uh, speaker, Prof. Lucas Bull, Prof. Rono, Prof. Roni. I'm here. Okay, how are you? I'm doing well. Yes, yeah, so we have all the speakers here, and uh, Prof. Ronnie, you said your wife is going to join? Um, yeah, Katrine, do you want your own link, or? <laughs> she'll, she'll come over here and, and right. join us, yeah. Right. So, she's, an epi she, she's an epidemiologist uh, and is teaching at the university, so. Yeah. Um, Her expertise is needed for this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so can everyone uh, see my screen here? So I'm going to introduce the webinar and we're going to start after the introduction. Okay. Uh, uh, you can, Scott and uh, James, you can see the screen, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah. Right. The... Okay, so our uh, webinar today is titled Original, originally titled Higher Education in the Time of Pandemic, Rhetoric, Reality and Reform in the US, Indonesia and uh, Australia. However, uh, uh, a good friend of mine, I think he's celebrating Eid. Oh, who's doing this? <laughs> so, uh, never mind, doesn't matter. So, uh, Scott is here uh, uh, to replace him, which I think uh, it's very fortuitous because uh, out of the problems and issues that we're going to discuss later, I'm sure uh, some of them uh, will be, will be uh, resolved or the way out or a solution uh, could be shown by, by Scott yeah, with his uh, initiative Unis for All, which I think does not only apply to the US, but also to Australia, Europe, the UK, and even maybe post-colonial countries such as uh, Indonesia. For example, uh, in Medan, our city budget is uh, 6 trillion, I think about 60 or 600 million uh, dollars, and yet our top university budget is 2 trillion, which is a third. So you can imagine uh, how big a uh, major university is uh, and what kind of budget crisis what kind of uh, financial crisis they are facing now uh, uh, all over the world, yeah? So we have three speakers. Uh, uh, Prof. Roni, I hope you don't mind going first. Can, can, you, can you hear me, Prof. Roni? So you're going first, I hope you don't mind, yeah? 
ya. Tidak uh, apa-apa. Ah, terima kasih. Ya, uh, Prof. Loni lama di Indonesia. Dia bisa bahasa Indonesia dengan fasih. Dia baru pulang dari Indonesia. Uh, I'm going to conduct this thing in two languages. I don't mind me. I will translate later yeah. if necessary. Dia baru pulang dari Indonesia awal tahun saya kira. Dan uh, banyak karyanya. A lot of his works uh, dalam bahasa uh, Indonesia. Also, I haven't make the uh, usual greeting. Ya. Assalamualaikum. Salam sejahtera. Uh, ahoy, hello to all of you everywhere, all over the world, and I'm sure we have lots of more people joining us later, yeah? Okay. So, uh, I usually, I don't introduce people by their uh, status or uh, title, yeah? I introduce them by their work. So you can see here, uh, Prof. Roni, his major work, one of his latest work also is Islamic Higher Education in Indonesia, Continuity and Conflict and uh, Scott, Unis for All, an open let letter to the U.S. higher education mm -hmm. community, and I think can also be applicable with modifications to other places, other continents, other countries. Uh, uh, for some reason, uh, uh, Prof. Roni and Prof. Scott uh, uh, are, are from the same place, which is Florida, North and South, respectively. Uh, <laughs> this is not a, a plan, yeah? it's just a coincidence. <laughs> And Scott, I hope you don't mind presenting second. It's fine. Okay. Because James here, our third speaker, uh, whose book is uh, Human University, Remembering the Moral Soul of Education. He actually has several more books, uh, which he can share later. And he'll be presenting third, James. You're fine, yeah? Fine, I'm fine. And uh, roughly 20 to 30 minutes to each of you. And we have the rest of the time for questions and answers session. So, without further ado, I guess Prof. Rono and his wife can start to present. I'm going to stop my screen sharing now. And remember that uh, this uh, uh, webinar will be uploaded on YouTube, and you can see it later on bit.ly slash Surya channel. So, without further ado, uh, the screen is yours. I have allowed screen sharing, Prof. Rono, Prof. Rony, so okay. you can start. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't have anything to share, but um, so sure. let me start yeah. with uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I'm very thankful to have this opportunity to speak to everyone uh, today. You can see I'm kind of pretending I'm actually in Indonesia. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I'm coming to this mostly as a faculty member at a university that's taking some interesting steps. Um, the university, so a lot of American universities, of course, are, are um, a little, you know, there's a lot of different approaches to, to returning to campus. Um, the University of North Florida um, has taken some very interesting approaches. First, back in June or July, faculty who felt that they needed um, to not to avoid exposure altogether had the option of requesting teaching online or teaching uh, remotely and uh, because I have asthma and uh, and the jury is still out whether that's a risk factor or a protective factor um, I have elected to teach all my classes remotely from home um, the, the university is actively encouraging people not to come to campus if they don't have to. Um, you know, they are also having, you know, rules about, you know, um, wearing masks and social distancing. Um, and one of the interesting things we're doing as a base of all that is everybody, every staff member, every faculty member, every student has to complete a, a COVID-19 course um, so that everybody's on the same page. Like, you know, you know, so it's not like, oh, well, I've got a difference of opinion. No, this is the university, this is the, these are the facts the university is using. You know, why do I have to do that? Refer back to your course. And I think, because there's so much disinformation 
out there about this as well as misinformation. I think it's very, it was a very good step for the university to, um, to require this. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased that, that people have the option. I also am in the unique position, or we are in the unique position of our son is starting as a freshman at our university. Uh, and so we're also getting to see how the university is communicating with students and the things they're trying to do. And when he signed up for classes, a vast majority of them were remote and the few that were face to face are now talking about going remote. And this is, you know, about two weeks before the semester starts. So I think that there's some very interesting um, strategies. And um, my wife, who's, well, quite actually well published in epidemiology and uh, medical medical journals, so. Um, I just here. wanted to volunteer some of the things that we have been doing. So I am the undergraduate director for the Bachelors of Science in Public Health. And this fall, I'll be teaching three sections of epidemiology to our undergraduate students, so 120 students. So when asked how we would like to deliver our courses, we were encouraged to do them online as much as possible. But with some of our courses, we're very used to teaching them in person. Our students really struggle with some of the content um, that we deliver. So my choice was to go online with a hybrid model. And so instead of having three classes of 40 students that would meet on some of the days, we have a classroom that would hold 40 students and they each class each person <laughs> will have the option of three different days in the semester that they can come in groups of about 10 to 15 people to allow for social distancing within the classroom with masks to have me work through the exercises with them. So for some of our classes that we really struggle with to have all the content online, we have the option to reserve a larger classroom, have fewer students come, reduce the number of days that they're gonna be there on campus, um, just to do whatever we can to prevent disease transmission. These sessions are also optional, so we don't want to force anyone to come. They are recorded so that the students who can attend can still get the content. It means that I will be teaching the same content multiple times, I think probably nine times um, for different gr small groups, but I'm only doing it three times total. So there's three types of content that's very hard for me to convey online. So those are some of the, the choices that we've been making um, to try and help keep our students as safe as possible and also keep our faculty as safe as possible. Um, they've also told us that when we're meeting, we were gonna have a faculty meeting and a big auditorium and there's only, you know, under, 12 of us and they said no you have to do it by zoom if you need to have a meeting you have to prove to them why it needs to be in person if you're going to do that within our college of health so um we you know thought it would be okay but we're told no we need to do it by zoom which is fine um and when i meet on accreditation because we are an accredited program with one other person we were thinking in a big room we could take our masks off but they said no if you meet with anyone within any closed space even if we're sitting 20 feet apart because it's a closed space we need to keep our masks on which is fine right which reminds me of one of the choices i made i actually chose to cancel one class 
because my anthropology of religion class is usually for 12 to 15 students. And most days we sit in a circle and we talk and we debate and it's really a seminar. And I actually teach it to them as preparation for graduate school. And I could not see doing a seminar class six feet apart wearing masks. <laughs> Just like, it's like, I can't do that. That's, that's not a feasible thing to do. Um, and so, you know, I, I canceled that class and picked up another one. Um, so, you know, the, I mean, these are the things we're doing. One of the things that um, I think DHS has backed off on the rules about uh, foreign students having to have some face-to-face -face, um, or face deportation, losing their status. Um, but still the un university, you know, sent out uh, a message that said they were gonna be working with all the students to make sure that they were in compliance and do some sort of things. Um, at some, I can't remember where, some other university in the United States uh, before, uh, you know, the decision was reversed, it was actually anthropologists said that they would hold face-to-face uh, -face classes just for international students so that they would have, um, you know, they would meet this requirement. Um, and I had a number of students who were going to be placed in my hybrid course, even though meeting in person was optional because it would count towards what they needed to be able to stay in the country and right. finish their education. Right, but, but thankfully that's been reversed. I think for an introduction to our thoughts on it, that's what we have and you know, we'll participate in the discussion. Thank you. So you are saying that uh, personally you are very affected by the uh, pandemic. How about institutionally? Have University of North Florida planned to lay off, lay off any staff and any lecturers, any uh, faculty or support staff? Um, as of right now, no. Uh, a, there is some budget cuts coming down and one dean um, miscommunicated that this might lead to some salary adjustments, uh, but that was a miscommunication uh, and that's gone out to the unit. University has sent out a message to everyone that, you know, this is a miscommunication, don't pay attention. Um, but um, what's likely to happen, and, and based on my experience with the quote, great recession of a few years ago, is that, and then how the university handled it there is no one got laid off, but through natural attrition, people with them weren't replaced. So, you know, if, if someone left for one reason or another, then. And I can say from my department, we have 400 undergraduate students and about 40 graduate students in public health. And just looking to spring, we can't really do anything for fall, but for spring, we are putting some bigger classes together whenever possible to reduce the number of adjuncts we need to teach those courses. So we have been asked to try and look at our budget and think about course delivery and being as fiscally responsible as, as we can. And how many uh, ratio, what's the ratio of adjunct to full full time or uh, how do you say that? Uh, normal uh, teaching staff, what's the ratio? So our department, because we are kind of the biggest program in our college for undergraduate students, we only have nine full-time tenure track faculty. And for the undergraduate program, about over half of our credit hours are offered through our adjuncts, which in some ways is a bad thing because we have so many adjuncts who are teaching our students. But on the other hand, it's also a wonderful thing because most of them work in public health. So the students really get exposed to that um, 
experience that they bring from the field. And I was an adjunct for about eight years before starting full-time last year at UNF. And I feel like, you know, the work I did really brought a lot to the program, the adjuncts we have and the visiting professors that we have who work in the field really bring a lot to our program. The downside is we don't pay them a lot. Um, they do a lot of work. They're incredible. And the students don't always have that continuity or relationship with people. We'd love to have more, you know, full-time permanent tenure track faculty. And then I would say in the College of Arts and Sciences in, in the anthropology program, we're kind of the opposite. I mean, we have maybe eight or nine of our classes total that are taught by adjuncts and only two or three. Um, and of course in, you know, uh, so this is, it's a different, but again, we, for our adjuncts, our adjuncts aren't people who are, you know, working in, in the field. They're, you know, academics trying to piece together a life teaching multiple classes at multiple universities. So it's a different, um, a different situation. Uh, as for the uh, COVID-19 uh, policies of the university, are the faculties involved, especially those from uh, epidemiology or related experts? We have two people in our program who are epidemiologists who have been involved in the working group for bringing students back to campus. And our nursing program, our health science programs have been actively involved. Okay, so it seems that uh, UNF, your university is doing fine throughout this pandemic, if I listen to you correctly for the past few minutes. I think that for right now we're doing fine. Um, in the future, we may have a lot more economic strain, and I will say that our students are really struggling. We've had many more student issues due to mental health issues, um, yeah. Black Lives Matter, effects of protest and structural racism affecting mental health, um, physical health. I've had a number of students who have had the virus and have been out had a lot more medical withdrawals from class. So it's a constant kind of just holding everything together. So can I ask with a question? that then, pardon? Oh, could I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Are, are you um, at UNF or have you taken a, you know, a bunch of dorm deposits and, and are they planning are they planning on just piling the, the young people into the dorms? And in addition to that, in addition to that, uh, how about school fees? Are they reduced or still the same, even with online classes? So um, first, if the class is actually distance learning, there is a fee. No. But oh, yeah. most of our classes that were in person and now are being taught online are designated remote. So we waive that fee, even though they're going to be completely online. So I would say, no, there is not a fee. And as far as the dorms, from what I understand, they're reducing the capacity. But yes, they are going to have a lot of students in housing on campus. So now we switch to our parent role and our son made the decision to not, <laughs> to not go. He's like, no, this is crazy. Can I stay home? Because we would say, you've got to go live at the dorm, even though we're 10 minutes from campus. And he's like, can I stay? Yes. <laughs> you know, this well, is mom may have pressured a little bit also. Well, sister, sister, his older sister figured out that each of us had concerns and we weren't talking to each other. And so she said, hey, you guys should talk to each other about this. And she, she attends college in Florida and is not living on campus yeah. either. She's down at New College, so. Are you concerned about a, 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 I mean, I'm concerned about explosive super spreader events. 
You know, I mean, these are like just, you know, static cruise ships, right? I, I, it's hard for me to imagine this working out at all. And I'm, I'm really, I'm just really concerned about it becoming a, a tremendous public health emergency. And then what do you do, right? What, are there any plans? Are there any plans at U, UNF to, um, to quarantine them to, you know, you, you build a, I build out an ICU at the, you know, in the dorms. I, it just seems crazy to me. Do you, you send everybody back home to their parents and their grandparents? So there are plans that they have announced for quarantining students if they do become sick and doing contract contact tracing. And we have a daily check-in app for how you're feeling and things like that. And um, I share your concerns and I can't really talk about policies or procedures or thoughts from people that haven't been officially announced. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Prof. Ronnie and Catherine, right? Your name? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I looked through your Facebook profile <laughs> before uh, <laughs> yesterday, I think, because uh, Prof. Ronnie said that you're going to speak, yeah, so to find out your name and a bit more information. So, uh, from the perspective of uh, epidemiology, uh, how long do you think this will last? Do you have an estimation, Catherine? Um, I am personally planning through at least next May or June that um, we are going to be struggling with it. Are there things that we could do if we had really great leadership? Yes, but um, as of right now, we don't. So I think a lot of things will be decided in our next election, which will then take some time to be put in place if we have a change in leadership in January. Um, I think our university is doing everything they can, but that this will be an ongoing issue through at least next June, um, oh. severely. Just to get uh, an estimate, yeah. So, what's your student population size, right? Like, sorry. So, um, it's about sixteen thousand students, but about ten thousand full-time equivalent. So, we've got uh, a number who are only taking one class or two classes. So, um, yeah, no, the campus can get quite packed. Um, the hallways and breezeways um, between classes, um, you know, the, some, of the, some of the social distancing things would just be completely impossible, um, you know, um, if, if we were operating in a normal, in a, a normal capacity. Um, so, so um, we're so not. Quite, it's quite a huge uh, university, yeah? Hello? Uh, it's actually one of the smaller ones in the state university system. It, oh, you, uh, you not the smallest. I mean, that's like new college with like less than a thousand students. So USF will have more students, I guess, Scott. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're huge. I mean, I don't... I, it's like 50,000. I don't, I don't know how it breaks down because we're a system and we have satellite campuses, but yeah, we're, we're I, when I first moved here, I think we were number nine, the ninth largest university in the country. I think we're lower now. I think we're like 11 or 12 or some, 13 or something, but yeah, it's quite big. And I'm, I'm the, I think with a few bumps, and a few negotiations and missteps and misspeakings, which it sounds like happened at UNF too. I actually think that it's been relatively okay with how they're treating faculty. Um, uh, you know, maybe. Um, but you know, I just think it's uh, darn near genocidal to 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 take a bunch of deposits for dorms and and 
stuff of a bunch of young people in our dorms. You know, I'm going to be okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm teaching remotely, but I really worry. Yep, yep, yep. All right. So I guess this is a good segue uh, to your coming presentation. So Prof. Ronnie and Catherine, do you have any more to say before we uh, proceed with Scott's presentation? No, ito semua yang hari kami. Terima kasih. Okay, sama-sama. Uh, so let's uh, hear from Scott now uh, for solutions. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't hear uh, many problems previously, but never mind. Later, James will share a lot of problems, a lot of uh, issues with this uh, pandemic and uh, higher education. So, Scott, over to you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, oh, that's how you do it. Keen. I've never done this before, to be perfectly yeah, top honest. Left, on the top left. Let me Start see. screen and then top left. Okay. Oh, and it says, oh, I need to check system prefer preferences. Uh oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't Don't realize. Worry. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Top left. Meaning like when you press share screen on Windows, yeah. on Windows 10. Oh, just do desktop. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the easiest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but this says, <laughs> this says share preferences. Okay. So have you And then pressed... I have to... Oh, I see. Uh, uh, Zoom will not be able to record the contents of your screen until it is quit. <laughs> what? This... this are you using uh, Windows or Macintosh? Mac. I'm on a Mac. I see. I apologize. Doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm, I, the, it comes up. It says it gives me all the options, right? And it <laughs> says top left is desktop one, and yeah. I click share, uh -huh. and then it says allow Zoom to share your screen. O open system preferences to security, privacy to grant access, and then it takes me there. And there I am, and it says allow the apps below to record the contents of your screen even while using other apps. And then I'm okay. clicking I, on it. I have, a, I have a solution for you. You can yeah. just send uh, the file over the chat here, and then I will share my screen showing your presentation. So here, just send it here. Uh, I'm typing it. Uh, just send it here. There is an option for file there, uh, so I can share your screen. Uh, okay, but then am I going to be able to click it? I have to click it for you. <laughs> oh boy. It's a patch, it's a, it's, a, it's a second best solution. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me find the file then. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to share my screen. I've actually prepared, uh, some Surya. Other... Yes, yes, yes. Surya. Yes, yes. If, yes. if I if I do my presentation now, yeah. whilst um, Scott is looking for his stuff, and then by the time I finished it, Scott, is that <coughs> is it, does it sound cool to you? It is. It is. Yeah, you, you can yeah. go ahead. Maybe it, it, it tells me to get. To me. Yeah, it tells me to get off the call. So I might do that. I might get okay. off the call to. Well, all, all because of... we've got a whole pile of people here listening to us, and. You know, it's uh, late. <laughs> um, so if I if I do mine and then you come in by the time, hopefully <laughs> that's been sorted out, and then you come in. Yeah, after great. That. Yeah. Does that Please. like sound like a fair deal? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for interrupting, but I just thought we'd get things get things rolling. All right. Um. Okay. Well, let's see if I can now avoid. Let's see if I can do this share screen. Do my slides come up? Can you see my slides? Hello? Can you hear me? And you can see my slides? Good. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, well, Firstly, um, thank you everyone for uh, for taking the time to to come and listen to this Zoom uh, presentation. Um, I I was asked by Surya to talk about higher education and uh, 
the whole coronavirus um, uh, issue. Um, I guess it's something that we're all we're all in. Um, I, I titled my presentation "Unintended Consequences," and I wasn't quite sure whether that would take me. But perhaps before I before I do begin, I'll just sort of point out that um, I'm actually from Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia, and uh, I was discussing beforehand with Scott uh, that we're in the middle of 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 this pandemic uh, in a quite a serious way. Um, those of you who follow the world news would would know that um, uh, that that uh, for example, uh, last night I think we had I think it was about six hundred uh, new cases, and the night before uh, we had about um, let's see around about seven hundred cases. So we're in the middle of of this uh, big time. Um, and we're in a we're in a what we call a stage three lockdown, so that gives you a little bit of colour and movement about about uh, where I'm coming from in this, um, and just a few of the characteristics of, of this of this lockdown that we're in. Uh, we can only go out to do things like shopping. Uh, we can do ex exercise, um, but except for running, I think it is except for jogging, uh, pretty much we have to wear the mask. So if I go for a walk for an hour, I have to wear a mask. Um, and to give you a, a bit of a sense of, of things, um, there's a $200 fine here in, in Melbourne if you are caught not wearing the mask and you don't have a good reason or whatever, the, whatever it is. Um, then there's a $200 fine. And I'm just looking at the latest news. Uh, Victoria Police have issued 124 fines for coronavirus breaches across the state in the past 24 hours, including 53 people who refused to wear a mask in public. Um, and you can imagine the stories that, uh, that, are, that are unfolding on our media about all of that. So that's a little bit of local colour um, from me uh, in terms of being from Melbourne and, and the coronavirus. In terms of my presentation, um, I guess what I thought I'd do first off is just, um, let's see if I can, Get rid of this side, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, I thought that uh, firstly, just have a look at the headlines around the world. I, I had a quick look. Um, coronavirus could be make or break for university finances. Australian University's $16 billion black hole as COVID-19 student numbers plummet. Um, universities forced to sell assets and look at mergers. Universities face disastrous uh, fallen income due to COVID-19, so on and so forth. So that's that's just a random uh, bunch of, of, of headlines around the world, but you'll see the relevance of these headlines to, to the presentation that I'm gonna give. Um, I looked at the International Commission on Futures of Education, uh, UNESCO, set up by UNESCO, and their joint statement on the COVID crisis um, uh, essentially points out that uh, educational opportunities around the globe have expanded uh, over the last few decades, um, but that given given the situation we're facing, a lot of this is now under threat. Schools and universities are closed in most countries, affecting over ninety percent of students globally. Um, even as learning continues, uh, we're at a moment where massive efforts will be ne will necessary to make sure that the twenty twenties do not become a decade of lost opportunity. And this is from UNESCO. Um, and I think that the, the key, the key uh, uh, message from the, the UNESCO report on this and futures in education, the key takeaway for me and what, where I hope to um, end up with in this, in this discussion um, is that whilst there's a lot of threats here uh, for us in higher education, there is also potentially opportunity um, because partly there's opportunity for us to think about what it is we're doing in higher education and what, uh, what, what it is we think uh, we need to do. So I'll start there. And I'll, so I've begun with, with UNESCO and some of, the, some of the headlines. I'll keep going. Um, the IAU, the, uh, and I've started globally because I want to uh, move in from the global picture to the local picture. Um, the IAU, the International Association of Universities, uh, released a report. I, by the way, at the end of these slides, I've got all the references. So once I get there, I'll put that up, and and you'll have you'll those of you who are following this will have the ability to to you know 
look up the, the, the stuff that I'm referring to. Um, and basically in their report, they, they point out there's considerable impact on higher education. They point out the, the way in which, and this was referred to before, um, the way in which online teaching and virtual mobility are now coming into play as in partly as a response to this. They point out the different impacts on different, uh, different um, institutions of higher education in different national settings and so forth, which I think is extremely important. They also point out, and I put in red, and, and you'll notice throughout this um, presentation where I put in red uh, things that I want to focus on a little bit, the risk of growing inequality as a result uh, of the impacts of this. And of course, they also point out, again, in a hopeful note and reinforcing what I talked about with the UNESCO report, um, it opens up that opportunity for us, whether we take it or not, of course, is another issue, of looking at the role of higher education and reassessing it and so forth. Now, before I head into the Australian sector, again, just a bit of general, general um, background. The Economist Intelligence Unit uh, report for 2020 on COVID-19 and the crisis in higher education um, basically points out that higher education institutions across the world uh, face multiple hits to their income. Now, this is something that's a, a big ticket issue in Australia, and I'll explain why uh, later. But uh, big uh, issues with income. There's a big potential impacts on jobs um, uh, with uh, scarce domestic student applications, um, and also a big impact uh, with uh, international students, which I'll talk about later. Um, Whilst a lot of institutions are moving towards what they, you know, we call online learning, um, the question is, is this sustainable or, or not? Uh, big issue. Um, the shift to online learning, if it was sustained and if this became the norm, uh, would also, could also open up uh, different issues of market competition and so forth. People, uh, I, I said unintended consequences, um, uh, some of the unpredictables here um, uh, could include if, if institutions do move towards uh, more online learning, then of course that could open up um, uh, the possibility of a more concerted private sector competition um, for the obvious reasons. Um, and again, something that the Ec Economist uh, Intelligence Unit pointed out, Countries that typically send a lot of students abroad, such as China, say for example in our case, uh, India, Vietnam, Kazakhstan, etc., um, according to this line of reasoning, may have opportunities to disband, uh, sorry, expand domestic institutions if private and public funding allows. Of course, that's a big if. Um, so let's focus on Australia, and I am going a little bit fast, but uh, as usual, I've overprepared. It's my bad habit. Um, Australian higher education newspaper reports paint a difficult picture. Jeff Maslin writing for the World University News um, with campuses, and this is in May, I think it is, yeah, uh, 22nd of April, sorry. With campuses shut down across Australia, the nation's universities face an economic catastrophe and massive job losses from the COVID emergency in higher education. This is what the sector was saying in April. According to a report by Fergus Hunter in the Sydney Morning Herald on May the 3rd, 2020, titled, Never Waste a Crisis, uh, Will COVID-19 Be a Catalyst for Change at Aussie Universities? Um, according to that report, universities are looking at losses of 4.6 billion or more in the next six months, with 21,000 jobs on the chopping block, according to Peak Bodies, uh, Universities Australia. And modelling from Victoria, Victoria University's Mitchell Institute, which I've got in a file here as well, projects um, that the blow could be up to 19 billion over three years. And finally, uh, just, to, just to make it more depressing, um, Anne Davis writing for The Guardian Australian in the 26th of July of this year, Future Shock, How Australian Universities Are Changing. Um, the immediate and obvious challenge is for universities to find the right balance between online and physical teaching and to do it with fewer staff. Note that, to do it with fewer staff. 
And again, she, uh, she writes, one of the most likely outcomes of the pandemic will be that universities will be thrust into the arms of business as they seek ways to fund research. So these are the sorts of headlines in Australia. These are the sorts of opinions. Now, um, whether, whether some of this, you know, whether this comes to pass and so forth, it's anybody's guess, but this is what is in the public domain. This is how people are seeing these issues. Okay, let me continue. Um, I downloaded a paper because I, I wanted to, I was looking for something that would give me a little bit more grist to the mill, a little bit more um, substance um, than just, to just uh, you know, uh, newspaper uh, reports. And I found a very interesting, there's a very interesting paper uh, put out by the uh, Centre for the Study of Higher Education at the University of Melbourne. Um, and the paper by Willem Croucher and William Locke has become a, um, uh, it's, it's actually being uh, quoted and, and, and read with great interest uh, at the moment. And according to this discussion paper, there are 10 trends that they see following on for, for higher education, following on from this pandemic. They talk about diminished student capacity and preference for travel to undertake international education. In other words, there is a, a slowing down of this. Well, that's obvious. Um, and the longer this goes on like this, uh, uh, then uh, the more pressure there is um, on, on, on our capacity to, to, to travel, to undertake international education. Uh, the growing acceptance of online study by people. Now, there's a great debate, as you know, uh, on this, and I'll, I'll quote some other research where there's some um, uh, you know, to, to negative aspects to this as well. But nonetheless, um, this has opened up the, the whole issue of the nature of online study. And of course, it begs the question. Um, we, we often talk about the so-called new normal. Um, I, I'm a hater of, of a lot of this jargon, but nonetheless, uh, uh, if, if this is to continue for a, a while, then this whole issue of, of online study becomes more salient. Um, Diminishing attractiveness of certain degrees and programs. Um, partly, this links back to some of the issues I raised before, um, or that was raised before in the uh, newspaper columns. Um, essentially, essentially, when you have uh, growing competition, growing unemployment, um, and so forth and so on, then what you, what you find is that people really start asking themselves, what's going to give me a job? What's going to advance me economically? Just to give a bit of, again, a bit of local colour, in our family, in my extended family, we've only got one person's actually got a job, right? And most of us have lost our jobs or uh, uh, don't have one, um, or at least uh, not a formal salary paying, paying style of job. So, for example, um, my, my daughter's uh, partner, he's going for interview, he's a, he's a, uh, oh, yeah, uh, a mechanic. Uh, forklift mechanic and of course as you can imagine uh, a lot of these guys were thrown out of work um, because of, of, of the slowdown and so forth so um, this is this there's a, there's a there's going to be a lot more focus on on bang for buck if you will on the economics uh, of of you know what does this degree get me and I think that's a there's a there's a lot of negative to that it's a great shame in a way uh, again, I hope for reasonably obvious reasons. Uh, for example, the humanities, what happens to them? Um, diminishing capacity for governments to invest in higher education and research. In, in our country, um, because we've relied so much on international students to generate income for our universities, when international students don't come to Australia, um, then this has a huge, a potentially huge impact on on in, on income and income goes to to research income goes for jobs income goes for things like uh, buildings and all of this sort of thing um, and of course another impact that the research talks about is the potential for reorganization of universities and their workforces now i put that in red um, because i think that uh, that's not something that is going to happen easily uh, there's great potential for industrial conflict, for example, uh, if, if that goes ahead. Um, the second uh, list of uh, 
issues that was came up in the research, government and public reliance on areas of expertise do, uh, deemed relevant to economic and social recovery. So there's, there's limited dollars um, and there's a need to get out of this, uh, what could be a depression. Um, and so the, uh, the whole argument is going to be, according to the, this line of argumentation, is that the government is going to simply put the, put the emphasis on those areas of study, those areas of the university that drive economic performance, okay? In a far more uh, radical, it's the wrong word, a far more disciplined fashion. Uncertain prospects for university delivered transnational education. Uh, in the near term, uh, potential for fewer students traveling internationally. That's, I guess, obvious. Um, it also, this, this also has an effect on further research collaboration, um, which people are starting to, to think through as well. And less philanthropy and external research funding. Why? Because there's less money. Okay. Um, now this is, I'm not necessarily endorsing these, these views, but I'm saying that this is what the research, this is what people um, at our central, our leading research institution into into the study of higher education at the University of Melbourne. This is what they're saying. Uh, some of the potential uh, outcomes of, of the result of this uh, COVID pandemic. Um, some further issues outlined by Andrew Norton, who's a uh, important uh, academic here uh, in, in terms of higher education policy and so forth. Uh, he points out that the vulnerability created by universities' reliance on international students has been brutally revealed this year. Travel bans and so forth um, have simply undermined uh, our, our international student market, okay? Um, with surpluses being hit hard, the funding logic um, also means that there's going to be an effect on, on, on things like the types of jobs, I suppose. There's gonna be an increase in specialization amongst the academic staff. So what that means is that um, for the most part in universities, many uh, uh, academics combined teaching and research. Yeah. And, um, but uh, according to some, some uh, scholars who are looking at the trends that are occurring now, what might happen is that you get much more of a division. So you have um, uh, people simply doing teaching and then people who, really just only focus on research. So that kind of mix, if you will, um, the argue, so the argument goes, that might um, be, be threatened uh, due to the results of this. Um, and of course, in red, uh, we can expect academic morale to fall and industrial action to rise as universities, university work, workforces resist this. So, what we can see, in other words, and this is from what a lot of the academics working in the, in the area are saying, is that if, if there is this uh, cutbacks, if there is restructuring due to the cutbacks, and so on and so forth, then of course that's going to, it's, it's not as if that's not going to uh, have potential industrial consequences uh, in terms of the unions uh, and in terms, of, in terms of staff having, having uh, levels of resistance to this. Um, okay, let me continue. Um, I kind of wanted to draw a conclusion. I know I've gone through this pretty fast. Um, the International Commission on the Futures of Education, if you recall, I began with them uh, from UNESCO. In the renewal of education, human interaction and well-being must be given priority. Technology, particularly digital technology that enables communication collaboration and learning across distance is a formidable tool and a, percent, a potential source of innovation. Yet we should be increasingly concerned that a shift to remote online learning will exacerbate inequalities, not only in the global south, but even in the most well-resourced corners of the planet. What we have to do is ensure that digitalization doesn't undermine privacy, free expression, informational self-determination, or lead to abusive surveillance. These are all potential potential outcomes here, uh, and and this is as I say. If you, I, I'll give you the resources here to to follow these reports so that you can read them for yourselves. But these are the sorts of concern. Um, 
In the final analysis, educators, learners and their relationships must be at the core of reconstructing education after the disruptions of COVID-19. Finally, re revisiting the purposes of education has become imperative. And I guess this links back to what uh, uh, when Surya introduced me to, to the kind of research that I've been doing, uh, which is all about uh, looking at the purposes of higher education. So I think in, in essence, um, I, I hope I haven't given you a too melancholic or pessimistic <laughs> description of the situation here, uh, but uh, I, I have at least, I hope, uh, introduced you to, to some, of the, some of the arguments that are occurring um, in our particular context. And finally, uh, for those of you who'd like to follow up on, on all of this, the um, articles and research that I've cited are all here in the, in the references, so you can, um, you can have a look at that and follow that at your leisure. Um, I guess I'll end it now. I know I've gone rather quick uh, through this, um, but uh, I think that in, in summation, um, I'd say that there are certain threats that are that are coming from uh, as a result of of the economic uh, disaster that has unfolded um, uh, for us all, um, but also there is potential for opportunity for us to to engage the idea of well, what is it that we think education should be doing, and and um, whilst there is a lot of uh, concern and worry about about the economics of this, um, not least, for example, amongst um, amongst. Uh, uh, let me see, just to give you a before I before I stop, um, just to give you. I hope you can see this. Um, this is a National Tertiary Education Union um, magazine in Australia, and. Um, you can see that the latest. Uh, uh, you have to, it, you have to share that. You have to ah, share the window, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Look, don't worry about that. Um, basically, all I was saying is trying to wrap up and say that um, uh, these issues are issues that are that are concerning to people. And I was just uh, drawing your attention to the to the uh, education union, the NTEU, who is also onto this because they can see the implications of of things such as the effects on casual staff being affected, the public funding cuts, um, and, and so on and so forth that may come uh, as a result of, of the impact of, of COVID-19 and uh, the economic impact of it. Okay, thank you very much and terima kasih. And, uh, thank you very uh, much, James, for a very lovely, very <laughs> thorough, very rigorous presentation. This well, is a very good, uh, 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 foil yeah, for, for Scott's presentation, I think, because you are highlighting all the issues and problems that are faced by higher education, not only in Australia, I think, but over the, all over the world. Uh, in, and if I might, can you uh, stop uh, sharing screen so I can, I can... Yes, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Hold on. If I may share a bit on the Indonesia situation before Scott's presentation and Q&A later. Meeting your screen is new share. What does that mean? Do uh, I just uh, stop? Uh, stop uh, share. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Okay. I've done Thank it. you very much. No so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share my screen before Scott yeah, for a while. So here, what we have in Indonesia, uh, even though we do not have many international students, uh, but we do face uh, the same problems. So, for example, uh, let me. do I okay so I have here open on my browser uh, yeah. uh, see our president calls universities to foster mutual help amid COVID-19 pandemic and uh, this is on 4th of July yeah quite recent and it is said that we should share curriculum and syllabus library collections online Lectures, lecturers even, and lectures online to advance together and to help all university students throughout Indonesia to progress. So that's the call from our president and uh, from Wikipedia. Uh, 
uh, is us. So already in March, we have 17 universities, major universities, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, Universitas Indonesia, Gajah Mada, Teknologi Bandung, all of these are Indonesian premier universities located in Java. They have closed classes and said that they will replace face-to-face uh, -face lectures with uh, online lectures, yeah. Uh, I don't see any university from Medan here, but I think Buretno later can confirm that uh, similarly, we are doing the same. Uh, and also, uh, Buddha Lena, actually my mom, yeah, from Uisu, Pak Sohibul from Umusu, and my, my dad also, Pak uh, Sulaiman from Umusu, they can confirm that they have been doing lots of online uh, classes. Uh, okay. And here from uh, Surabaya University, yeah, Unair, uh, University in Surabaya. So they are reviewing uh, education, yeah. And this is from the State University Rector Council. So Forum Rector Universitas Negeri, yeah. Indonesia has lots of state universities, Islamic universities, education universities, and general universities. So they are reviewing the thing, including uh, uh, reducing or even eliminating, but I think reducing the single tuition fee, yeah, which has been uh, uh, stipulated previously in a regulation by the minister. So it can be temporary exemption, reduction, cluster shifts, installed payment, and postponement even, yeah? While classes are going online. And then we have here uh, a webinar also in May. Uh, all Indonesian universities, they propose policies to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. And I think a lot of their inputs has been taken up by the minister and by the director, director general, yeah? of higher education Dirjen Dikti and also the House of Representatives yeah so Prof Nizam I think here is from uh, a university uh, I'm saying that 315 billion rupiahs have been allocated to support teaching hospitals that's what I was saying education hospitals yeah uh, and medical faculties okay and uh, 400,000 underprivileged students uh, have been supported through the Indonesia Smart Card for university students. Yeah. Also, private universities are doing a lot also, yeah, including uh, uh, contributing in terms of artificial intelligence and uh, biotechnology. And okay, also here from the uh, religious uh, education, higher, religious higher education, state Islamic universities, private Islamic universities, Recently, the ministry, Minister of Religious Affairs uh, have issued a decree for tuition subsidy, as I said just now. So it's official and uh, it's either subsidies or installment, yeah? Uh, uh, and you can see the, a copy of the decree there. And, okay, uh, I think that's it from me. Now I, I, I uh, leave, I, I give the floor to, give the screen to, to Scott to share his uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Scott, over to you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to try this again. Let's see if it if it works. So I think you have to, oh, here. Desktop, share. Can we all see this? We're good? Yep. All right, OK. Well. Thanks so much, Surya. Uh, I really appreciate all these remarks. Uh, I do think that th this was a better order, uh, <laughs> uh, really. Uh, I think that James's remarks uh, really set up um, my intervention here. Uh, I wanna say that I, I really appreciate the global perspective. Um, I know much less about the global perspective. I'm mostly focused on the United States, but of course I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the global perspective. And I think this project that I've, I've been working on um, has wide applicability. Um, just acknowledging, right, that the um, the politics and uh, the, the particularities of every situation are gonna are gonna have to be dealt with in in contingent ways. Um, I do think this is a time, as James suggested, to be rethinking all aspects of what we do at, at a university with our faculty, our our staff, our students, and our communities, um, and that it's it's long time to remediate 
all kinds of injustices and inequalities and, and to be on the lookout for increasing ones that are happen be, happening because of this pandemic. This pandemic is an incredible challenge. We have to admit that it's going to obviously require all kinds of temporary and longer term transformations in what we do. And we're going to have to sacrifice certain things that we're used to doing and experiment in new ways and hopefully in just ways. That said, I'm here to argue that the entire framework uh, that James was reporting on, not necessarily endorsing, but reporting on, that suggests that everyone, every government, and every, every university system and university and college is necessarily running out of money uh, is the wrong framework. It is a contracted, reified, market-reduced market, uh, framework, which I will suggest uh, is not the only one <laughs> available to us. So just to uh, get things started, uh, I, I'm calling my presentation Unis for All Transforming University Finance Through and Beyond the Pandemic. I am a Associate Professor of Humanities and Cultural Studies at the University of South Florida. I also help co-direct the Modern Money Network, which is a 501c3 educational uh, organization uh, that promotes public understanding of money and finance through education discussion and scholarship. I also co-host a um, podcast called Money on the Left, which uh, uh, a little while ago was picked up by Monthly Review online. You all can check that out. Uh, and I'm a research scholar at the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. Um, so I want to talk to you today about um, this um, both, both economic technical proposal, but also a political and, and social proposal for financing universities through and beyond this crisis. Uh, I am working with uh, a, a host of colleagues on this proposal. I am not doing it all alone. Uh, and, and in many ways, you know, there, there, are certain, there are certain participants in this process that have been uh, involved in similar, not quite the same, but similar efforts uh, for a really long time already. Uh, I'm working with economist Benjamin Wilson, communications scholar William Sass, sociologist Jakob Feinig, um, uh, PhD student in comparative literature, Maximilian Seho, and then uh, a kind of freelance research scholar, uh, Nathan Tankis. So I just want to acknowledge uh, my, my cohort here that, and suggest that, you know, I'm, I'm not doing this autonomously and I'm sort of presenting on their behalf. So we're, we're sitting essentially in a, a depression, right? And, you know, some people want to call it a recession. Uh, I, I, think, I think this is a, 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 a tremendous depression um, and, and that we, we need to be um, we need to be frank about that and to be um, mobilized to, to respond to this, right? Um, in the United States, uh, we're seeing woefully inadequate federal action. We had a, a CARES Act early on. People made a big deal about the big giant numbers that came with this CARES Act. Sure, it was helpful, but of course it wasn't enough and it was maldistributed and, you know, we're already... Um, and have been in need of more support um, across sectors. Um, what we're seeing, as James was reporting, is collapsing state revenues or the threat of collapsing state revenues um, and tightening budgets across state and municipal sectors. Um, what does this mean for colleges and universities? Well, the, uh, the, you know, the going narrative, I think, uh, both in the states and across the globe, is the cuts are, are they're either here or they're coming. It's been an uneven response, I think globally, but especially uh, in the United States. I mean, certain universities seem to be holding, uh, holding their budgets together. Um, others are, are definitely either threatening to uh, or are, are, are leaping straight into kind of shock doctrine austerity that we've seen many times before, never letting a crisis go to waste, so to speak, uh, in the name of some kind of uh, neoliberal market god. 
Um, the, uh, what we're seeing with this shock doc doctrine, of course, across sectors, but in the university um, uh, systems themselves, is a systemic abandonment of the most vulnerable, whether we're talking about contingent faculty or, um, you know, or, or, or students or, or um, you know, support staff. You know, people are being hit hard. They're being thrown out of work, you know, and, and th this is the, the opposite of what we should be doing. This is a, an absolute tragedy and, and people are, you know, losing their health care if they had it. Um, there is resistance. Unions are standing up. There's various kinds of organizing efforts going on uh, at different campuses. Um, some successes, a lot of, of uh, non-successes. Um, and, and there's a lot of critiques being published out there. Um, and, you know, I think that one of, the, one of the kind of prevailing critiques is a critique of the very structure of university financing, especially in the United States, which, which has been um, drastically cut, right, at, at the state level, um, direct public support, which, which basically um, makes the the public university uh, it have to kind of fend for for dollars on its own and and, and become more and more of a you know, for profit organization even if it's not making for profit but for revenue right um, a revenue constrained organization and at the same time we're seeing um, these giant financial arms um, growing in in universities especially private universities um, but but everywhere. Uh, right, participating in um, you know what some call casino capitalism. Right, so they have endowments that are locked up in all kinds of assets, and um, you know, and, and nowadays um, you know the, the these universities, whether they're lying or telling the truth, are are you know claiming that they're you know these assets are not liquid. They can't they can't spend um, they can't spend their endowments right now. And there's all kinds of um, you know back and forth and, and debate about that. Uh, probably the most well known critic of this. Uh, university casino capitalism is this uh, French scholar, uh, Francois uh, Furstenberg, uh, who has been uh, uh, kind of capturing this critique with this phrase, uh, uh, a, a hedge fund with a university attached, right? Um, I actually kind of hate this phrase because you can, you can critique, you can critique the university, the American university, you can critique um, its financing strategies. You can critique how those financing tr strategies actually trickle down to, to every level, but I think it's false to suggest that these are not people, educators, workers, students, you know, <laughs> actually participating in a community, right? So I, I, I think this is a, a, a cheeky and sexy way of, 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 of making a critique, but I, but I think it's problematic. Um, I'll tell you what really, really motivated me. I think it was just the catalyst, um, but what really got me um, starting to work on uh, a response and an alternative um, was this COVID-19, a, a statement of academic solidarity that came out very early on. I mean, it might've been April. Uh, I, I should find the date somewhere. It was signed by, um, very, very famous um, American academics, people like Judith Butler and Naomi Klein and Adam Tooze. I don't know if these names are familiar to anybody. And the, some, the whole framing of this infuriated me. So these are leftists, right? They wanna protect the most vulnerable. They're, they're against, you know, they're against drastic cutbacks. And they say, universities everywhere are now weighing layoffs, furloughs and hiring and pay freezes. While we recognize, I can't read this because this thing is in the way. How do I get this thing out of the way? Basically, what they're saying is we urge universities to meet out the cutbacks in as graduated as, uh, uh, a fashion as possible, and they want to shield the most vulnerable. But what they've totally done, what they've totally given away is the debate about whether there should be cutbacks or not, they've, they've made it inevitable, right? They've, they've accepted that, we're, well, we're, we're running out of money, we're gonna have to cut back, let's do it in a nice way, right? Rather than in a, a, a mean way. 
Um, I am here to say, and started immediately working on a counter framing, a counter proposal, to say that depressions are not necessary, they are never necessary, and that austerity is never inevitable. Austerity, in fact, creates and deepens depressions. FDR eventually figured this out. Um, John Maynard Keynes was very aware of this, uh, as, as are so many other heterodox economics. What I want to do is to get us beyond what I'm calling the Jaws meme. Uh, and I think we've all seen uh, these Jaws memes. There's lots of different ones. Um, here, here's one. I'm pleased and happy to report that the so-called coronavirus is completely under control. As you can see, it's a beautiful day. The beaches are open. People are having a wonderful time. So this is from the blockbuster, 1975 blockbuster by Steven Spielberg, uh, Jaws. And the mayor of the town is, is caught. I mean, he's an evil guy. Uh, we don't like him, but he's caught, right? And, and we, we, the film takes this for granted. He's caught between either the economic viability of the town or community health and safety, right? And what he does is he sacrifices community health and safety for economic viability by keeping the beaches open for this tourist town so that they can, you know, make, make the money they need for the entire year in their seasonal economy. Um, a time and time again, you've seen memes online um, basically quoting or you know, refashioning this scenario for, for the COVID crisis. And you know, I think that there's obviously a, a critical dimension and a, you know, a way of poking fun and having fun um, in this, and, and I would support that. But I think that the Jaws meme, um, as it circulates, doesn't actually push us beyond this zero sum either or framing economic viability or community health and safety. And, and this is precisely the framing that it seems to me everybody is taking for granted. That's why American universities are taking deposits, promising face-to-face -face courses, although that's starting to change, but taking deposits for dorm living and, and just willfully putting kids into dorms because, not because they think that's the right thing to do for health and safety, but because their budgets are going to collapse, they say, if they don't do this, right? So they just sort of, they're, they're kind of bluffing, right? And people have written about this, um, but I don't think anybody is really challenging this Jaws meme logic of either or zero sum, you have to choose between one and the other. And I'm here to say that we have tough choices to make. We don't have a, a COVID playbook for the best, most prosperous, just way forward. We have to improvise and figure that out. But the money problem can be, can be framed in a much more capacious way that makes us much better suited for taking this on. So I work in, I'm a humanities scholar, but I, I work in an, a heterodox economic field known as modern monetary theory. It comes out of uh, multiple traditions of heterodox economics. Uh, the, the most adjacent would be uh, post-Keynesian economics, if anybody's heard of that. Um, also has linkages to institutional economics uh, and, and other sorts of economics. Modern monetary theory, what it does is it takes money seriously as a medium that actually organizes our political economies. Most traditional mainstream neoclassical uh, economics don't. They, they wish it away, money's not involved, and, and they imagine that, money, that, that um, economics is a bunch of private finite exchange relationships, and that money is somehow just a kind of veil that, you, that, that um, is neutral, and, and it just sort of tracks those objective, uh, finite, private kind of money physics, right, or exchange physics. What MMT says is, no, this is not, this is not how it works. And if you actually pay attention to money and history and anthropology um, and present operations of money and finance, that's not the way that political economy actually operates. So some quick bullet points, um, uh, uh, trying to introduce what MMT, modern monetary theory, argues. 
First, they argue, that, or I argue, we argue, money is essentially a tax credit. It is not a private exchange token. Now, there's a few arguments packed in here. One is that money is a public utility. It, it comes from a currency issuing government. Um, whether your government issues it or not, some government has issued it uh, if you're using it. Um, and uh, so it's not essentially private. It, the private sector grows out of the public sector through the monetary relationship. And money is grounded in what's called a fiscal tax circuit. The, the um, issuing authority has the capacity to create money and set the unit of account. And what they do is they charge various taxes, fees, fines, any kind of non-reciprocal obligation for settlement. And this incentivizes, you, one could argue, forces the people of a population to, to work for this money to pay their taxes. And in the meantime, also to meet their basic needs. So money is a public tax credit at, at the basis, not a private exchange token. Secondly, a currency issuing government can never run out of the credit that it alone creates and authorizes. This gets at yet another little argument that's hiding in the, in the top bullet point, which is that money is credit from an MMT perspective. Credit, money, money is not some real objective thing and credit is a promise for money, but money just is credit in the first place. It's a promise to pay. And the argument of MMT is that a currency issuing government that creates their own credits cannot run out of those own credits that they either create directly or authorized to be created by banks or other financial institutions. What this means is that inflation, not affordability, is the only fiscal constraint that a currency issuing government has. And what, what we mean by this is the, the real constraints are, well, what real resources, labor, capacity, infrastructure, um, know-how, technology, do we have at our disposal? What do we wanna do? What do we wanna spend on? And at what rate do we think we can get there? Now, if, we, if, if a, a, a federal government spends a lot of money in a kind of willy-nilly way, in a way that a, a, a country is really not prepared to absorb and to mobilize, then you can cause inflation. But the question is not affordability, it is the inflation constraint. And then a kind of key, a key logical, uh, a key kind of logic and sequence of credit creation that MMT argues for is that credit must be issued, it must always be issued before it is received. And this is the case in the public and the private sector. So credit comes first, taxes come second, or credit comes first, or revenues come second. That means that both the public and the private sector that relies on the public sector actually don't primarily depend on tax revenues or private revenues. Those matter. We're not saying they don't matter. But what makes a public or private organization or institution a viable going concern is not their income, it's their access to credit. And their access to credit is a political matter. It is not a necessary economic law. And we, any, any currency issuing government can always more, make more credit available as long as they're doing so in a uh, smart way and thinking about resources and inflation constraints. From an MMT point of view, money is thoroughly political. It's not neutral. It's also a function of legal design. In fact, it's nothing other than legal design. And because it's a function of legal design and, and laws are designed in certain ways in different ways in different contexts, it can always be redesigned. And this is how I propose we get beyond the JAWS meme. This zero sum thinking presumes a finite private exchange market world where all we have are the rises and falls and the inevitable inertias of the market treated as this quasi-physical system that we use all kinds of physics metaphors to describe tsunamis of debt or right? this kind of thing. 
we need to move past this and recognize not that we can do anything or we're suddenly superheroes, but that credit is not a problem as long as we're mobilizing politically and designing our systems legally. Now, this very quick introduction to MMT is very breezy. There's lots of details to work out, and especially for post-colonial so-called developing or global south countries um, who don't, don't issue their own currency or they've pegged their currencies to uh, hegemonic currencies. MMT has a whole kind of what I would call a, a, a decolonial wing. Um, and so two of the most important scholars in this field are Fadel Kaboub and Nango Sambasila, who are both my good colleagues and friends. Um, I, I implore you to go check out their work. Um, we can deal with some of those issues later. But what I want to do is I want to get to the uni. And, and to, to take on the crisis uh, in general, but in specific, um, it, the, the American university, it takes political analysis, right? And if we look at what's happening in the United States, we see Congress being feckless, reckless, and deficit averse, right? They're not spending and not spending enough and not helping enough. And this is why we're piling young people into dorms, right? Because we don't trust Congress to actually help university communities through this crisis. If we did, then we could be pursuing all other kinds of goals. We see these collapsing state revenues and tightening budgets, that's scary. But what's happening at the same time is that our central bank, the Federal Reserve, which is you know, no enlightened institution, uh, historically speaking, they are throwing out their old rule book and they are engaging in paradigm smashing experimentation. Um, Neil Kashkari, the Minnesota uh, Fed um, chair, has, is on record now saying that the Fed has infinite cash, infinite cash to support uh, the financial sector and beyond. Um, they, they are on record as saying they learned their lesson from the 2007-2008 crisis. They acted way too late. It was a year or more after they got most of their programs up and, and, and going. And this time around, they're going big, they're going bold for them, relatively speaking, and relative to Congress. They are taking massive amounts of debt onto their balance sheet uh, right now. Right? So they've kind of opened their doors. And in doing so, I would argue, made themselves a central site for political contestation. And I think that's not happening enough. Of course, the corporations and the financial institutions are taking advantage of the Federal Reserve, but not enough of the public sector or activists or organizers are doing so. The, the, the kind of more specific opening that the Fed is giving us all uh, to politicize this process is a new facility that they've created called the Municipal Liquidity Facility. And this basically um, is just offering, like they do the financial sector and the corporate sector, it says basically municipalities and states are, are critical infrastructures. We want to make sure that their balance sheets are you know, under control during and, and through this crisis. So we're going to offer to buy munis or municipal debts, right? And, and um, and that's going to hopefully help uh, municipalities through. Now, um, the interest rate terms are punishing. You know, I said these are no angels, the Fed. Um, but it is interesting. It's throwing out the old playbook, and it's, it's opening up a political process. This isn't the beginning. I mean, sorry, this isn't the end, right? This isn't what you just accept. This is, this is a way of politicizing the way that money and credit are allocated and provisioned in the United States. So what does this mean for the politics and legal design of university finance in uh, the COVID crisis and beyond? Right, so this is where the uni comes in. So we're coming from an MMT analysis, which says we can afford it. The question is, you know, what are the politics of it and what's the legal design? We are calling the uni uh, the uni after the muni, right? So it's a kind of play, right? Like uni university, um, but you know, like the muni for municipal debt. And uh, what we are arguing the muni is, 
is it's a form of financing that's a form of self-financing. So rather than getting uh, begging for money from Congress, which it's not coming anytime soon, um, or, or begging for money from the state legislature, which they're doing already, but it, that's not coming anytime soon either, um, we're arguing that there's a way of that public universities and maybe even private universities in consortiums with public universities can begin to finance themselves to provision the way they need to improvising in relationship to this crisis. And what we see the uni doing is offering both a, uh, a, a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. And we say, because of the nature of this crisis, you have to do both at the same time. So let's talk about the bottom-up approach. The bottom-up approach is what, what, in, what uh, public universities and public university systems can do just, just from themselves, right? So what we say is they can, they can issue what we call university payment anticipation notes. They're called UPANs. They're based on the tax anticipation note, which is a much more um, widely uh, known um, credit legal instrument. So the university payment anticipation note, they create, they create this credit and they create it out of thin air. And they do so, they do so because they are a provisioning authority. And in fact, they, they do create <laughs> credit, but normally, but, but instead of creating their own credit and funding themselves, what they do is they create credit and they sell it to private bond markets. What this bottom-up model is uh, suggesting is to create the uni as a complementary currency, right? So this would be n not ha having the, the uni be uh, a U.S. dollar, but a complement to the U.S. dollar. And the reason why the, uh, a public university can, can engage in this, because not everybody can engage in this, is because they're already fiscal provisioning authorities in their own rights. They are economic anchors and drivers and engines of regional economies. In the United States, universities and university systems are the number one or number two, sometimes number three employers in the entire state, right? This means they have massive payrolls. They have massive workforces. They have, you know, lots and lots of students. Their economic activity involves and, and extends out into uh, the regional community in inexplicable, I mean, you know, infinite ways and in ways that the more that there's austerity at these anchor institutions, the more those communities are gonna suffer, right? So these are kind of meso level, tremendous institutions. And because they already have this power and already have this authority, they are well positioned to create a complementary currency. Now, the way this complementary currency works is it is predicated on these UPANs, right? University payment anticipation notes. It's based on the anticipation of future payment. And this is predicated upon essentially their own tax structure. They have systemic and ongoing non-reciprocal obligations coming to them in the form of tuition, which of course is too high and we would like to do something about, rents on their massive property holdings, fees, fines, all kinds of things, right? So they're already operating a massive payment system and they've got income coming to them despite the threats that, that they're going to be, uh, that, that the incomes are going to be um, lessening in this crisis. They nevertheless have a massive robust structure if we're talking about the large public universities and university systems, okay? The key here to come back to the, to the MMT analysis, remember, is that credit not revenue, finances everything. And that's the case here as well. You lead with credit and then revenue comes in later as, as in a way to close the fiscal loop through this non-reciprocal obligation. But in no way should we be thinking that we're somehow, in the way that Marxists somehow talk, we're stealing revenue from the future in order, the finite revenue from the future, in order to somehow uh, magically uh, fund us uh, uh, in the present. No, the, the MMT analysis says that credit always become, comes before revenue. But when we recognize that, then these other possibilities become available.
to us, right? So the, that MMT analysis is key here in that way. Now, as a complementary currency, the uni has to create and maintain and be careful uh, with what is a <clears throat> relatively tight fiscal loop. Its scale of receivability as a complementary currency is limited. What this means is unis can only be used to pay for, for um, uh, labor and other things um, that, are, that can then be easily cycled back to the university and redeemed by the university itself, right? So one example of this would be, um, uh, you know, like graduate student housing, right? Uh, graduate students will receive a uh, stipend or, you know, some kind of uh, re remuneration for, for being a TA, and then they pay a lot of that back to the university in the university-owned housing, right? And so that's a service and a good that the university offers directly. Uh, and so that can always be redeemed in terms of the uni. Now, why we argue for this bottom-up uni issuing um, is because it, it is uh, meant to mobilize and increase monetary agency on the part of public universities. We are promoting a uh, participatory finance uh, in, in the spirit of John Dewey. We want to experiment and learn by doing. Um, we also want to move the university away, not, not just from the kind of state defunded for-profit model, but really truly toward a granting model of economic provisioning, where like with any academic grant, there are obligations. You can't just do whatever you want with the grant money. You have to carry out a task. You need to show what you've accomplished. Maybe, maybe you know, write up a report, send your, send your book that you wrote uh, to, the, to the granting authority. But we want to move past essentially this commodification of, of education and in fact all of our basic needs, right, and our basic social goods through this model of self-financing and granting. And this, we say, is the best way to mobilize, to activate, to get unions, to get Black Lives Matter, to get Green New Deal activists on board for, um, for saving our universities and really transforming them uh, toward other ends. Um, so my... Uh, colleagues and I, what, what is, oh yes, my colleagues and I are uh, currently uh, putting together a NSF uh, grant. It's a multi-million dollar grant to run a uni complementary currency at uh, SUNY Cortland uh, in New York. Um, and, you know, I'll let you know if, if we get the grant to run this thing, you know, to run the infrastructure and the payment system for this. Um, but what we also, I, I want to close by pointing to uh, the top-down uh, strategy, which in the middle of a coronavirus depression, we, we have to pursue, right? So what this means is um, doing them both at the same time and seeking and politicizing Fed support, okay? So a complementary currency is a great thing and you can build it up over time and you can do it carefully and you can do it you know, responsibly um, and make sure that that credit is, is worthy and expand its sphere of influence. But we don't have time for that, right? We need to stop the, the, the fiscal hemorrhaging right now. So for that reason, we, we argue that admin, leadership, organizers, activists, unions should be going to the Fed and making it the central site of political contestation that it is becoming and that it should be even more and, and for the people and for the public and not just for the private sector. So we argue we, sh we should be demanding full liquidity support for the uni. This can look different in different ways, right? It can, one could imagine the, the Fed becoming the buyer of the uni of last resort, which means anytime anyone anywhere has a, is holding a uni as a complementary currency, the Fed will always buy it at par, so it's as good as the US dollar. What we say is the, the strongest path forward to, to uh, stem the, hem the fiscal hemorrhaging right now is just to demand the Fed buys these unis outright, no, no extra charge or interest rates, 
and simply convert unis into dollars immediately. So this is gonna require politicizing the municipal liquidity facility and pushing it beyond what it has originally been designed to do. But all of these institutions, all of these facilities are up for grabs. The Fed is improvising and we should be improvising too. And what we want to do is essentially open up this MLF improvisation to a whole politics for a public option for liquidity. If um, part of the MMT project is to think about the banking system, and there's, there's uh, some scholars, Hockett um, um, Omovara, uh, who are colleagues of ours who are kind of MMT adjacent, who have analyzed the banking system and how it, it uh, works to provision liquidity. Um, and what they've called this is the finance franchise. So the way that, that banks work, well, the, bank, the way that we think banks work is that they take our finite deposits and then they lend them out. This is called the loanable funds theory of banking. From an MMT and MMT heterodox adjacent point of view, this is utter nonsense. Our argument is that banks create credit out of thin air as authorized by the a currency creating authority. So you need a certain capital requirements. You can't have no money or no capital to be a bank. That's in the law, that's legally designed. But when banks extend loans, extend credits, they're not moving around finite deposits because money is not physics. Instead, they are saying, oh, you seem like a credit worthy recipient. We'll give you a line of credit and voila, that credit becomes available as a promise to pay, which as part of the federal banking system ha is insured, right? So what we're arguing is that banks, especially in the United States and in multinational uh, financial organizations are mostly neoliberal and very awful and unjust and equal in the way they allocate credit. They allocate liquidity on behalf of credit issuing authorities. We say that universities actually are like really good at provisioning, right? They're in and part of, they're the hubs of, of, of massive regional economies and communities. And for all of their problems, um, they have lots of, of brain power and lots of cooperation that they're orchestrating and education all the time and community outreach. And they would be way better to give this finance franchise agency this monetary agency too, and especially in a time of crisis, but of course beyond as well. This is how we fully realize a grant economy rather than a revenue driven or revenue constrained economy building out from the uni system. This is how we start modeling a future where we were decommodifying our basic social goods. This is how we get beyond the zero-sum Jaws meme that we giggle at and say, isn't that mayor evil? That mayor is just like Trump, but our own political imaginations can't se seem to get beyond that at the same time. Here's my coda. I've, we've, my team has talked to a variety of, uh, of, of um, you know, faculty and students and organizers about the uni, you know, nothing really, really um, tremendous has happened in terms of political organizing yet, but there are glimmers of hope. There are sparks that are happening. The, the one that I'm really the most proud of right now is that um, the resident assistants and peer mentors undergraduate union at UMass Amherst, along with uh, the graduate employment union, which is a kind of cousin or sister union under the UAW, at UMass Amherst um, reached out to us. These are the undergrads. We've gotten, we've gotten faculty members emailing us back saying, this sounds crazy and weird, right? Um, but the undergrads, the young people are like, bring it. Tell me about this. What can we do? And um, the, the person who contacted me is this incredible uh, organizer at UMass Amherst, James Cordero. I wanna give a shout out to him. Um, he's very brave and um, I'm I, so, admire him uh, and they they've put together uh, their list of demands to the to the university and it includes um, not just this paragraph but many paragraphs on the uni it all kind of culminates in the uni I wonder if I can move move this window Ugh. 
I want to be able to move this window so I can actually read this because <laughs> it's blocking it. Or wait a minute, I'll do this. We, what we are proposing is that UMass aggressively negotiate with the Fed such that unis are not loans, but are instead the Federal Reserve support of UMass's ability to issue credit. The uni model will revolutionize the way universities are funded. This model is not only a reaction to the current crisis, but also a bold way forward, which will end the privately funded model of higher education and usher in a new era of affordable, accessible, and dignified institutions of higher learning, which are self-financed due to the Fed support. Just as the Federal Reserve gives banks the authority to issue credit, it is time the UMass system pressures the Federal Reserve to give public institutions the same liquidity authority. Now, like I said, I think the uni principles here that we're developing are uh, extendable across the globe. The question is, what are the politics elsewhere? And I don't know, right? I haven't done my research, but that's the kind of uh, open research question that I extend to you all. So with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks. Can you stop uh, screen sharing, uh, Scott? Oh, yeah, yeah. I apologize. Um, yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Scott, for a very even more uh, thorough presentation on the concept of unis here. I see everyone's head, including mine, uh, were deep in thought here yeah, of the bold, innovative, and aggressive proposal that you are uh, presenting. And I hope that uh, later, uh, through the video that you are sharing on the YouTube, people can learn, uh, people can study, and people can contact you on how the ways to go forward. So before I proceed, uh, uh, I have noted the questions and comments from our participants here, but perhaps uh, if, uh, perhaps anyone would like to, any of the participants would like to voice out their question instead of me reading it. Bu Retno perhaps, or Satria, or Bu Anita from Siantar, or Pak Sohibul, uh, you can say in Indonesian and I will translate into English. Yeah, or even the panelists, even the speakers can ask each other. Yeah. Before I I I uh, uh, ask it myself, yeah. Anyone? I'll give you five seconds, yeah. <laughs> People are too shy. Maybe you should read it. <laughs> All right, I will. I will. Okay. So here uh, we have uh, Anita, for example. She says that she has a small university in Siantar, a small town uh, in our province, yeah, in Indonesia. So how is the how can the uni be relevant to her. So small meaning in Indonesia, usually you have only hundreds of students, perhaps several study programs and perhaps tens of uh, lecturers. So that's from Anita, yeah? Will the uni, is the uni relevant to her and how can it be relevant? And from Retno, I guess this is for, uh, I hope Prof, Prof Ronnie and his wife is still here. Uh, what do you think you have shared your personal experience with uh, online education also, uh, uh, as well as uh, some face-to-face uh, -face education during this time of pandemic. So do you think online education, distance education, virtual education is effective? Uh, uh, how can we measure the effectiveness? So that's from, for, for Prony and uh, uh, Bu Catherine, yeah? uh, uh, Madam Catherine. And from Sohibul, before Sohibul, I think because he has lots of comments here, yeah? uh, from Satria, uh, perhaps we should collaborate not only uh, within a particular country, so perhaps you could, we should collaborate, I will extend what he said that we should collaborate uh, uh, proposing units across uh, countries uh, because at the moment we have a global uh, bank organization, BIS, yeah? Bank of International Settlement, and as of this week or last week, very recently, Indonesia just joined the system. And I believe the US and uh, Australia is also in the system. I think we should propose that liquidity facilities should be provided for large organizations such as uh, universities in the new Basel Accord. I think now they have three, so Basel four, perhaps, you know? That's the like global regulation for central banks, yeah? Uh, because uh, there are questions also from some of my friends that says, 
universities are not banks, you know, but that's precisely the paradigm that uh, Scott and friends, including myself, including me, are trying to smash. Yeah. And last but not least, <laughs> from Pak Sohibul, yeah, uh, one point, one big point that we have lots of inequality in Indonesia, lots of poor <coughs> uh, students, poor people, and Anita has confirmed that lots of our students are also poor. They cannot even access the internet. Not only poor, but the area does not have internet access. So they are really disadvantaged. So we should have broader internet access and free on top of that uh, uh, internet access. So how can we realize that? And I'm just gonna read his comments because it's quite long, yeah? Uh, I'm just gonna pick out some, uh, some uh, pertinent points, yeah? We have, uh, I'm sorry to say that we have lots of people uh, complaining they cannot log in. I received like tens of complaints, but I'm not sure why they cannot log in. Uh, but I have to tell you that I tightened the security requiring people to have accounts because I'm afraid of Zoom bombing, given that this uh, uh, webinar is shared very widely. I even shared it on the president, Indonesia's president Facebook uh, page. Yeah? So, uh, so Pak Sohibul is saying that uh, uh, now so popular is the term learning from home. But those who speak, I'm translating this using Google Translate, especially those who are state administrators, do not understand their words. Indeed, if it only speaks for Jakarta and big cities, this is for Indonesia, yeah? It is answered for some of, my most, some of the most critical circles in the community. But what about the majority of the other, urban poor and rural people who have no rank uh, uh, and internet access? So on behalf of the Indonesian constitution, it's now the time to call the government to free internet access. Okay, and then another one, another comment by him, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, as long as it is still unable, as long as we are still unable to predict the end of this pandemic, countries that are poorly managed or lacking in resources and especially poor uh, should uh, sharply revise their budget allocation to prioritize guarantees of teaching and learning for primary and secondary education, not only higher education, yeah. So, uh, because Indonesia has a very young population, I'm sure also perhaps uh, some other post-colonial countries, African countries, for example, China, India have very young population, and we should not forget, you know, because some 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 large uh, uh, schools here, yeah, they can also I think apply for uh, schoolies or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Analogy. So I think I think uh, that is all. If anyone wants to 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 voice out their Concerns, questions, comments, please feel free. I guess we can start answering from Prof. Rono. Uh, do you think distance education, online education, virtual education is effective? And how to measure the effectiveness from Burat No, yeah? Uh, the screen is yours. The floor is yours. Um, it, distance learning can be effective. Uh, one of the things I've done that I don't, you know, advertise is I actually went through uh, an eight course certification to be what is called a master online teacher. And it can be effective. Some ways it can be more effective and can be more engaging. I mean, think about a discussion class where you've got, you know, four students who always discuss and everyone stays quiet. If you move that online and people have to type out uh, at their thoughts and then respond to people and type it out, then everybody gets to participate, everybody has to participate. Uh, so in some ways it can be, I think, more effective and a better experience. In terms of measuring it, I, I absolutely reject student satisfaction surveys because how happy a student is with the course is not a measure of how effective the course is. Um, and so, you know, we've been developing our own systems for, for um, assessment. And I think you start with assessment with a very clear set of objectives. What is it the students will be able to do? That is define, discuss, debate, uh, produce. What will they be able to do at the end of the course? And then you give them a project 
to see if they can do it. And that's how you assess the effectiveness of the course. I need them to be able to read five sources, synthesize them, critique them, and offer uh, their own opinion based on, you know, data. Great, that's the objective. You assign it, you let them go. So for my classes, oh, for my classes, I have a little bit of a different approach, especially online, but even when we're in person, because we're training people to work in public health. It's very skills oriented, but at the same time, we're teaching a bachelor's of science in health degree program. So we have certain things that have to be done to keep our program accredited within the public health accreditation for, you know, academic programs. But we also work a lot in the community and have a community board that we talk to regularly about what kind of skills to do our students need. And I was also a research manager for University of Florida for over a decade. And I would hire a lot of people to work for this research enterprise. So that's kind of my, or for the health department where I also work. So when my students this summer, I had epidemiology and research methods to teach them. It's like, I want you to learn broad undergraduate, you know, liberal arts and sciences kind of things and how to think, but I also want you, when you go into an interview, to be able to tell a potential employer, I know how to do contact tracing. I know how to consent someone using a consent form. I know how to run data analysis using um, technology since we're not on campus. We can't use our statistical programs or things that cost a lot more money. So how can I do that with Excel? How can I do some quick basic mapping to, of diseases, things like this? So it's very um, skills oriented and hopefully as we've worked through all of these exercises and tests, can do they have the opportunity to, um, let's say share answers a little bit more? Yeah. Um, there's only so much we can do. They can do that in the classroom also. But hopefully we're keeping that, um, you know, skills and quality measurement pretty high and motivating them that these are skills that you need to have a job. So let's get you those skills. And when we're speaking with skills, I mean, she's in a very much a, a skill oriented thing, but I think about anthropology, I think about even culture studies and do anthropology and religious studies, you know, the skills of, you know, go find sources, sim read them, synthesize, critique them, synthesize them. That's, you know, that can be put in terms, uh, you know, and I know we don't want to go too far to it, it's all about getting jobs, but a lot of the skills that we teach in classical university education are job skills, but you, but, but we don't do, we haven't done a very good job of selling that to employers or to the students that the classic education itself, you know, I tell business majors who take anthropology, why, you know, why should I take an anthropology class so that you have something other than accounting to talk about at a cocktail party. And not, can I just jump in? <laughs> and the other thing I love about the anthropology majors who come over to my epidemiology class is that part of the accreditation is that they need to communicate epidemiologic data both orally and in writing. And his students who come over can actually talk to people and write. And a lot of our public health students, because they're so focused on skills and science, we have to really teach them those skills. So it all kind of fits together, but you know, I will just add one quick thing about assessment. Since the 
remote teaching and COVID experience, we, I have felt the need to really chunk our program of study a lot more, give students a smaller amount of information, small amount of skill development, and then see what they learned, and then do something at the end to tie it together. Because I think that their mental health right now and the anxiety and, and everything that's going on in society is such that they are just physically and emotionally having a harder time learning and concentrating on the work that they need to do. It, it's a different environment out there. Right. You know, and so I, and, you know, I, was, I pushed her, it's like, why are you creating these one hour videos? You know, <laughs> 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I mean, you can do five of them, but you know, give them smaller chunks, you know, because the one hour video is just gonna be a little overwhelming. And this is also actually something that one learns when one goes through the training to be an online teacher, is the chunking, giving everything in about a 10 minute, 10 to 15 minute chunk. Uh, and you can give the same amount of information, it's just the chunks are smaller. I've only done one of the eight trainings that he's done. Thank you very much. I guess we also need these kinds of trainings. Uh, I'm not aware of such trainings yet in campuses in, uh, uh, in, for example, in my city in Medan. And I think that's a good idea to have those trainings, yeah? Even if we have trainings, only one or two sessions, which are very inadequate. So let's proceed to James before uh, proceeding to uh, Scott uh, later. So James, do you have any comments, questions, answers uh, to the uh, 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 participants' uh, queries or to the presenters? Uh, what do you think uh, so far? I'm, I'm not sure I have any answers. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I have any answers. I, it depends. You'd have to focus me on specific questions. There were so many, so many things you raised there. So do you agree, for example, with free internet access? Oh, if you can get it. Yeah, sure. Of course. Um, I think especially one of the great inequalities um, in, uh, in education, especially when everything's moving towards online, irrespective of what one thinks about that, um, is that the, 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 digital, the digital divide, the digital inequality, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. Um, on the flip side of that, uh, I know my, my son was uh, trying to get through university online uh, due to this whole thing, and he would be asking me, well, what am I, what am I enrolled for? What's the point of this? Um, he was uh, quite critical of it, but no, no, of course I agree that, um, uh, that, that the inequities by virtue of lack of access to, um, lack of access, for example, just to the internet um, is, is a huge problem. And, and increasingly in, a, in an educational environment where uh, uh, you know, much of the resources are online, uh, journals are online, you, know, you name it. Um, having those inequalities is, 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 a fund, is, is increasingly a fundamental issue. So yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, James. Our friend here has a question. Uh, she said that some of the university cannot do online classes. For example, healthcare, healthcare university, they have to do practical skill. So any suggestion? So, uh, me, uh, uh, Catherine and Prof. Ronnie, do you have any suggestion? I don't really have any suggestions, but I will say that our College of Health, we have nursing, physical therapy, we have had the same problem. And our undergraduates in public health are required to do a 300 hour internship to get that skill development before they graduate. And it has been very, very challenging. So if anyone has ideas, we'd love to know what they are. Okay, thank you. Of course, uh, uh, inequality and uh, digital divide, you know, all of this later, sooner, sooner, sooner or later will boil us down to, to, to money. So I guess let's turn now to, 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 to Scott's uh, uh, comments, answers to, to uh, what we, what the uh, participants have been uh, 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 asking. 
So Scott, please. Well, um, <clears throat> maybe to take on the question of the small, the small college or small university, um, I guess I would start with questions like, is it public or private or, or does that, you know, do those distinctions even make sense in this case? Um, is it part of a system? Is it a satellite campus or is it just a, a standalone, uh, very small university? I will say the smaller it is, the more private it is, um, the more I would say um, the, the political power in organizing around a uni is going to be lesser, right? <laughs> um, and so I, w my team would recommend drumming up support uh, in consortium with other local, and, uh, local campuses and larger ones um, and, and form a block. So, I mean, there's no, there's no magic here. It's just politics, right? And if, if you're, a, if you're a, a little guy, no one's going to listen to you. But if you're bigger and bigger and bigger in solidarity, more, you know, there's more of a movement than it can for sure. I, I will say um, uh, the Bank of International Settlements idea is great. Um, and I would be happy to sort of work on uh, work on that strategy, right? I mean, basically, it, it would be taking taking the polit the central bank politics that I'm describing, and and politicizing the Fed or other central banks. Um, and you know, you have to you you have to be tracking what your central bank is doing, right? Is it is your central bank basically doing nothing, or is it bending over backwards and breaking all the rules to try to support the you know, the business industry, the financial sector and beyond, right? Um, it's going to be a much harder fight. Well, it's going to be a hard fight no matter what, but it's going to be an even more difficult fight if your central bank is just kind of acting like this is business as usual and there's nothing we can do, right? Um, and in that case, you know, maybe, maybe your legislature is the better place to go, right? Um, uh, but so, so there's not one size fits all here. But I, do, you know, multinational corporations go abroad and make deals and do power plays and for exploitative and all kinds of terrible reasons, right? Um, there's no reason why progressives and leftists can't go abroad, you know, workers of the world unite, but with an idea about actually how liquidity works and, and politicize those institutions and say, look, this is actually possible. We demand that you do it. Otherwise, we're going to suffer. And we're going to suffer re very badly unless you help us out, right? So the, these, these central banks and these international uh, uh, liquidity mediators sort of rely on us to just accept the, the standard economics and to think that it's all you know, private market physics and that there's really nothing that can be done. They're not used to getting demands for for public options for liquidity. And an internationalist public university uni demand would be incredible. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, uh, James uh, yeah. was asking, uh, do you have, what do you think of students' acceptance of online learning? I guess you have answered it somewhat right, just now, right? Student acceptance of online learning, did you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do I think of it? Yes. Do you have... Um, can I say something? Sure, sure. Yeah. Can I ask to... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask to uh, Mr. Campbell about... I would like to highlight about your presentation. Um, uh, what was it? It says, growing students' acceptance of online study. Um, what I would like to highlight is that uh, the situation is not like uh, it's not the same within the Australia and United States and Indonesia. Uh, yeah. As yeah, as many um, participants said here that in Indonesia that we have um, uh, what we call limitation in terms of infrastructure, in terms of internet access, and so many uh, schools and. Uh, you know, higher education in the in in 
far away in the suburb suburb area uh, still have a limitation of in terms of internet access so it's not um, I think the future of education that the acceptance of stu uh, students acceptance of, 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 of online study it's not really I think Indonesian students are not ready yet to to face the new normal uh, yeah. in terms of study that's what I would like to highlight thank you no, thank you for that I, I, I agree um, I actually in that research that I was citing I sometimes think how can I say this I, I often think that uh, research often presents itself as objective and is actually a form of advocacy um, so often uh, people in these sorts of research are kind of push push a line as it were um, but I, I agree I think that um, whilst whilst uh, there's some acceptance in certain contexts in other contexts there isn't and due to economic reasons due to cultural reasons due to a whole host of whole, whole host of reasons um, and and to 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 be upfront with you I when I was looking at that research that particular I think that's the Center for the Study of Higher Education paper um, my anecdotal experience uh, certainly with my son and 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 even with my wife who's doing working from home um, is that they they're not at all comfortable with it <laughs> um, they don't they don't like it at all um, I, I can't give you any you know uh, uh, scientific or research um, validity to, to that but no I, I think that um, whilst the argument in that, that paper was that there was this so-called growing acceptance um, I also think that there's also a growing um, dissent if you will um in terms of online study and, and all of that and that's a whole nother argument uh a very important argument i think um but uh no no i i agree with you i don't i don't think that uh it's necessarily inevitable that everyone's um what's the word uh accepting of of you know the online thing and furthermore i think that the distinctions within uh different cultural different uh, economic situations and so forth are, are extremely important. So no, I thought that that's a very good point. And um, frankly, I agree with you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, I guess we have a lot of hurdles to overcome. Yeah, if we want to have online education, then we should provide we meaning the government, the elites should provide the facilities and for it should evaluate it and should make sure that it has the same effectiveness and efficiency. I think effectiveness, not efficiency as uh, face to face uh, classes. Yeah. Can I say to just, I mean, for, forgetting the COVID angle, <laughs> as it were, um, you know, there's a political economy behind the whole online thing as well. I mean, there are business interests that, you know, have an interest in, I mean, I know I sound, this is rather reductive, but, you know, th there's a whole economics about this, A, and B, um, just because something can be done online doesn't mean it should be. Um, and see, I must admit, I, I still am in the old school a little bit. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot, um, you know, still to be said for face-to-face -face human interactions. Um, I, I was just, I zapped up just before um, we were talking about Zoom, just as a, an example, just as an example. And in, I think it's the, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, National Geographic. Zoom fatigue is taxing the brain. Here's why that happens. Um, so, for example, um, irrespective of the inequalities and so forth, this technology does your head in <laughs> half the time. Um, and, 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 and I think this is another, another part of this. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a mantra about online as if somehow it's, a, it's almost like a theology. You know? <laughs> it's almost as if it's, you know, in all cases, this is what you should do just because this is what you could do or, or just because it exists. And my view is, um, nay, <laughs> no. Um, so both in terms of, of, of the diversity of situations where this it might not work, uh, we talk about economic, you know, rural versus urban, you name it, the infrastructure, et cetera, both in terms of those, those issues, but also in a more fundamental sense about the culture, the technicity, there's a word, <laughs> the technicity that that permeates that that that, that this uh, manifests in and represents that 
at, uh, it's kind of, um, you can see my hands moving, I'm trying to, trying to conjure the words. This technicity that, that, that these sorts of practices both inculcate and represent can also be deeply, and let, let's be blunt about it, they can also be deeply disturbing, right? Um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of, a lot of this is a very different way of being in the world, you follow? And many of the ideologies that permeate through this as well, uh, ways of interacting with people um, and so forth. So I think there's a real area of criticism. And I think that often um, you can see, I've got a little bit of passion on this issue. <laughs> often um, we find that, 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 that technology, so-called technology, um, uh, digital technology gets presented as if it's progress. Yeah? And so if, you, if you're critical of that, you're critical of progress. You're critical of modernity. You're critical of, and, and I think that's um, uh, also deeply problematic. None of this is meant to, to be a kind of Luddite or neo-Luddite neo, neo uh, uh, position. That is to say, you know, uh, uh, the smashing of machines and so forth. But all of what I'm saying is to suggest that, um, firstly, um, the question is, digital technology is the answer to what problem? Because it isn't just an answer, period, right? To what exact problem is this meant to be an answer? And does it work? Yeah, is it, is it fit for purpose? Not, we must do this because it's progress or because it's modern or because in the US and Australia you do it, therefore we need to do it. This sort of isomer, you know, mimicry, isomorphic copying and so forth. Um, so, I think A, there are practical problems with it, but B, there are more, there are also issues of political economy to it, and C, there's philosophical issues about, about humanity, about uh, how we interact with each other and who we are and so forth and so on. And I don't want to get too abstract, but I think all of these are, are, are issues. But underpinning a lot of this discourse of, digital, of the digital, uh, 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 digital discourse is this equation of it with progress that it's modern that it's up to date and then if you know if you don't go along with it somehow you're not up to date <laughs> you're not modern you're not and i think that's um talk about uh talk about uh imperial talk about <laughs> you know i think that's deeply problematic so i'll uh, i'll end there thanks thank, thank you very much james uh, for that answer very insightful very deep and i say i would say also very spiritual for me yeah? as yeah. you can see james is quite an old school person you can see thousands of books behind <laughs> him <laughs> yeah. and uh he also has two phds yeah one in politics and one in education so he is a very appropriate person to ask about all these things and uh, this is meant to you james but i guess i will forward it to scott uh, uh how do you how to get students to actively participate in online classes because uh, do we need to change uh, the mode or class style? And then you can close with some words on Eunice and what have you. So this will be your closing statement. Scott. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. I really think that um, there's, there's not a one size fits all way of, of doing online education during the pandemic. Um, I agree with James. Um, and I think that, um, you know, and this is part of a broader discourse, right? Of just technology is good, right? Oh, yeah. let's automate, let's automate these jobs because that's a good idea. You know, let's not think about anybody's lives or their experiences or their know-how, right? Um, so I think it fits into that. Uh, I just, I want to speak to that a little bit. I, I do think that this crisis is... The, we're, we're, we're seeing a kind of return to the repressed, right? Like the, the repressed contradictions that are coming up, right? So for years, it, we were talking about MOOCs and like gigantic online. It's going to, you know, this neoliberal Silicon Valley quasi-democratic rhetoric about it. it's going to democratize education and everyone's going to be able to get a, you know, an Ivy League education. Just, you just log on to, you know, harvard.com, uh, right? And you know, I think some of the some of the talk about MOOCs and stuff died down, but still, this kind of push toward privatizing, technologizing, um, 
you know, um, what we do in our classrooms and, and putting it online, you know, at least in the United States, as soon as this started happening, suddenly it's like, you know, parents and students and, and everyone, are, 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 everybody's saying like, no, we don't, we don't want this, right? And in fact, it gets even more contradictory because there's this, there's this growing sense that students shouldn't have to pay as much, and of course they shouldn't be paying anything, but they shouldn't have to pay as much as they are for merely online education. But the educators know, and even the business people know, that it costs more money, and it's more labor to move your class online, right? So if anything, you know, and some universities are charging more, right? And that, that, whole, that whole, everything about this is contradictory. Right? And I do think that there's going to be a, for all of the business interests that are trying to capitalize on this moment and are capitalizing on this moment, and maybe they'll win, I don't know. I think that there's going to be at a cultural anthropological you know, level of like habitus and desire, I think there's going to be a huge desire to get back in the classroom when it's safe. And I think it's already here, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, James, you want to respond? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I, you know, I, I yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think there's, there's, there's a kind of a, almost a resistance building, a kind yeah. of a, a, a kind of a resistance. And I mean, you know, we, we, we were inundated, uh, with all of these, um, uh, you know, uh, online videos of how much everyone was having fun with the online world, <laughs> you know, during the COVID all yeah, yeah. and everyone I know is saying, I hate the stuff. Right, um, right. Now, I'm, I'm being I'm being theatrical, but uh, you know, I, I've got another. I zapped up on a, You reminded me of another article um, from Aon magazine, the flexible work fallacy, uh, a great yeah. article. And in it, you know, I better put on my glasses. I can't read the damn thing. Um, Breaking free of the nine to five was originally a feminist project. So how did it become part of the oppressive twenty four seven work culture? Yeah. Um, one of the, say, for example, the digitalization and then being able to work from home from that, then you get this, this surveillance culture, uh -huh. which colonizes the home. So yeah. whereas before the home might be that, to use Christopher Lash's, <laughs> a haven in a heartless world, right? Mm -hmm. um, what you have is something that presents itself as democratic, as, you know, as empowering, as flexible and so forth, but actually carries with it uh, something quite different, uh, yeah. something quite um, authoritarian. Now I know I'm sounding rather dark, and I'm painting a, a dark. A, I'm, I'm taking the position of the Majesty's loyal opposition <laughs> on this, but um, I do think, yeah, I think there is a, a desire for face-to-face -face discussion, for um, you know, for human interaction. Yeah, and that's not just an that's not just an old desire. I mean, you yeah. can feel it. I mean, the young people want, they do want their old lives back. They do want the college experience, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I want my coffee shop back. So my son wants his <laughs> university back. You yeah. know, we, we, yeah. we want to go back. That's why many of us rail when we talk of the new normal. We kind of bristle at it. We say, hold on a second. You know, you know, we want to go yeah. back. We want to have, you know, take. A student want you know wants to meet their mates in the agora. Well, well Trobe Uni, with our old university, had the, the central square was called the agora. I think we all know, and um, they want to meet their friends there. I mean, let alone the educate, you know. Um, yeah. I, as I said, it's no joke. The serious things are said in the lightest of manners. I'd like to be able to go back and sit at my coffee shop. Mm -hmm. All of us want to have those practical human things. Yeah. Um, I think it's. I think. And there is, I think there's a growing sense of also disconnect between, between a certain kind of, um, uh, I hate the word elite, <laughs> um, a certain kind of discourse run by people who perhaps have an interest uh, in, pushing, in pushing all of this stuff. And, the, the, and, and, then, and then many people of the left and the right, they're not particularly, you know, it doesn't matter. They could be conservative, they could be liberal, they could be radical, it doesn't, you know, religious, non-religious, who enjoy that human, human touch, you know? Um, and I think it's, I think um, perhaps in some ways, perhaps in some ways, this might've pricked the bubble a little bit of the, mm -hmm. uh, 
of the discourse of, of the digital discourse, perhaps, mm -hmm. perhaps. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, James and Scott, for yeah. that uh, combo. Uh, I think uh, last, definitely not least, from uh, Prof. Ronnie and Catherine. Your closing words, and after that, we will close this webinar. Okay. Well, I mean, first, thank you, Surya, for hosting this. Uh, and while I generally agree that, like, I miss some of the face-to-face -face things, I mean, Indonesia, I, you know, in the last several years, I would spend at least a couple of months in Indonesia every year. That's not on the horizon for any time within the next year and a half. So this is, you know, a sad thing. On the other hand, there are things that we've started doing because of this that maybe should continue. You know, so during the, the initial height of this, our provost was sending out encouraging me messages every day. Now he's doing it once a week with news and encouragement and thank you for working hard. You know, hearing from the provost, even if it is a, you know, uh, you know, a boilerplate message that, hey, you're doing a good job and, and here's what people are doing, that feels good, you know. Um, the fact that meetings can be done online instead of, because sometimes when I have meetings, I have to drive, I'm driving into campus for a 45 minute or one hour meeting and then driving home. I mean, the only reason to go to campus is to have a meeting. Moving meetings online is a good thing. Yesterday I needed to talk to my doctor. I did, you know, ten, uh, ten, within 15 minutes of calling us, I needed to call the doctor. The doctor called me, we did a tele telemedicine consultation, you know, she determined she didn't need to see me face to face, she called in the medications, you know, as opposed to taking an hour and a half to drive their way, you know, there's some good things. This seminar itself is one of those good things that have come out that, that normally to have this kind of discussion, um, to, well, you would, first of all, you wouldn't have had all three of us, you would have maybe flown one of us, to Indonesia, and I hope we would have some of those again because that's a lot of how I get to Indonesia. Um, but you know, you can have three uh, non-Indonesians speak in the same forum um, using Zoom. I mean, there are good things that have come out of this rush to having to be online. We just need to figure out what is good and what what can and should go back to. Um, you know, other things. But I think the fact that we can have this discussion uh, for a very low cost, um, I think is one of the good things that have come out of it. And, you know, there's all these webinars coming up. So, Katrine, do you have anything to say in closing? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Uh, Prof. No, thank you. no, thank you very much. No, I would like to say that we have lots of complaints, even given to Scott, yeah? that this panel doesn't include any women speaker, but I would like to explain to them that this is not by design. <laughs> in fact, James has uh, participated in a webinar, in another webinar last week with a uh, uh, woman speaker, yeah? So I guess- uh, we Tapi ada give... satu. Yeah, yeah, and we have also Bu Retno here and all that. But I guess if you want like, uh, 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 I'm not sure how it is, but, I'm very flexible on this. I'm happy to have all women speakers, some women speakers, some men, male speakers, but never mind. We'll, we'll do it for next time. So we'll give the closing words uh, to uh, Boo Catherine, yeah? Miss, Madam Catherine, please. Just saying. Thank you so much for doing this. And it's been really interesting. So thank you all and stay safe. Wash your hands, wear your masks. Yeah, my, 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 wife, my wife is actually sitting beside me and she just pointed at your dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, James. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Andreas, Selwa, Sulaiman, Sohibul, Sami, Dahlena, Christian, Nur Asia, Ali Akbar, Angayar, Mayla, Anita, Afrilia, my wife, Buretno, Arfian, Satria, Ines, uh, Faisal Hamdani, Bang Faisal Hamdani. Bu Ida and Pak Dawud Batubara. So we, there are a few of us here. I have mentioned all of you. Thank you very much. Have a great Thank evening, you. James. I hope you have a good night's sleep. Have a great yeah. day ahead of you, uh, Prof. Ronnie, 
Catherine and Scott. See you Thanks. in the next webinar series. Assalamualaikum. Okay. Salam sejahtera. Ahoy. Oras. Waalaikumsalam. That's it.